There are many scenarios of what a post-Putin Russia would look like, especially following a substantial defeat in Ukraine. The obvious one is to assume that a humiliated Russia would blame the West for its defeat and seek revenge, forcing the collective West to rearm and prepare for the next act of aggression by the Russian Imperium. But reality has a way of throwing surprises, and we can't discount the scenario of a weak and fragmented Russia actually embarking on reforms and changes that begin the process of democratic transition and reconciliation. While seemingly unlikely, should we nonetheless be preparing to engage if Russia takes this course? And is there anything we can do to promote an outcome that will be far more beneficial for us and potentially for Russians themselves? Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe to help new people find our incredible speakers. And of course, if you enjoy the content, do please consider supporting us by becoming a patron or buy me a coffee. We are now planning a series of events to support Ukraine uh, over the coming uh, couple of months, and it would inc help incredibly um, any support you can provide. Dr. Stephen Hall is an associate fellow at the Henry Jackson Society. He's also a lecturer and assistant professor in Russian and post-Soviet politics at the Department of Politics, Languages and International Studies at the University of Bath. He's a specialist on Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, Central Asia and the South Caucasus and on authoritarian regimes. He also has uh, uh, written a book titled The Authoritarian International, Tracing How Authoritarian Regimes Learn in the Post-Soviet Space. We are going to put links into that. We have already discussed that topic on the channel. So if you enjoy this video, please do go out and check out our previous conversation. Stephen, welcome back. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for having me. And this time I come completely with a microphone. So hopefully uh, my voice will be loud and clear this time. Uh, yes. I should be I should be sponsored by the uh, manufacturers of microphones because I think <laughs> all the speakers who start to appear more than once come out and uh, you know invest in the kit. So that that's fantastic to hear. Well, yes, so thank you for that. As well. um, and let's let's start because I'm gonna I'm gonna flash this up. I don't know if it'll come out across the screen here, uh, but you are the author of an absolutely fascinating report which was recently discussed. Um, in an event run by the Henry Jackson Society, um, and Mikhail Khardokhovsky, uh, Bill Browder, uh, and others were there. It was a, a very interesting event, and this conversation really comes out of that. Um, and it does ask this crucial question, should we be prepared to re-engage with Russia? What prompted you to uh, uh, you know, write the report and create an event around this topic? Well, what, what prompted me was simply you know, the debate discussion that's been going on for so long, that obviously the focus quite correctly should be on Ukraine. But we do need to start thinking about what future there is in regards to Russia. The idea of pulling up the drawbridge, creating a concrete wall with security guards, with machine gun posts, keeping the Russians in simply isn't going to happen. It, it isn't going to ch change the situation. And saying that, well, Russia caused this war, and it did. Now it's up to you to sort it out internally. Off you go. Is not go doesn't really work in my opinion. So I felt this was really something that needed to be written in order to try engage uh, the thinking community in terms of what we need to do for planning towards a future, hopefully democratic, and I still believe that's possible. Russia. And it's challenging, isn't it? Because I think uh, during the Second World War, we very much uh, developed a clear vision for what a post-war Germany uh, may look like. And even uh, Japan, uh, you know, an idea of how these two countries could become partners in the international system uh, and what would need to be done to reform them. In both cases, one, we had a vision. Two, we had resources, vast resources that were put into making that happen, including the post-war uh, rebuilding of Japan and the Marshall Plan and so on, the huge kind of enterprises that back these vision and values up. And thirdly, both countries were occupied. It seems that none of these three things are even remotely in place at the moment for Russia. They certainly aren't in place for Russia. There is no strategic plan as to what happens, let's say, tomorrow morning in regards to Russia and in regards to Ukraine. There's no, cons there's no obviously, occupying force in Moscow, and it's very unlikely there will be. 
and there isn't an awful lot of money. The piggy, the piggy bank, as it were, is, is probably on, on reserve funds at this point. So there is certainly a very different scenario to what happened with Germany and with Japan. And But it still means that we need to think about how this can actually happen, how we can get, as the report says, getting the foot in the door, preparing for the future of Russia. And of course, we use the phrase, I use the phrase actually a lot, you know, the collective West, the Western Alliance, et cetera, et cetera. That does kind of gloss over actually the fact that each country has individual interests. Those diverge and to an extent, the interests of each country and even these so-called collective interests and values are actually not that well defined. And I would argue perhaps not that well defended either, despite the rhetoric we see coming out of many western countries no certainly i mean it's probably it's all you know always difficult with these labels when you want to try and explain a region in the world in the same way that people still use the post-soviet space wrongly but we haven't found a better acronym for that um it's just an easy categorization talking about the collective west but there really is no collective as it were these are individual countries they're individual governments beholden to their electorates they have their own geopolitical needs and economic needs as well. So they are working in tandem to an extent, but they are also separate. And this becomes that much harder. But to an extent, I'm not saying that this should be the West that does all of these things, but it should provide avenues for the Russian opposition, for the diaspora, for civil society to begin to propose a plan. Because ultimately, the West will not be able to impose an idea, certainly without occupation forces on in, in Moscow, in, in Russia, certainly not without a significant change in Russian culture, perceptions and various other things regarding uh, the West. But the Russian opposition should be given a safe space, an avenue in order to try and build towards this future. And this report is very much what the West can do to help that happen. And it's absolutely fascinating that this report, the report is actually very strong, very clear. Um, after the event, uh, it was discussed um, with Khodorkovsky, who, as you'll know, has recently written a book um, called How to Slay a Dragon. Uh, and that is how to topple an authoritarian regime without actually becoming an authoritarian yourself. And there are many ideas put forward there. And after the event, he said that he couldn't fault any of your suggestions, and it showed a deep understanding, actually, of the not just the situation, but the dilemma in trying to deal with Russia. So you have strong work being done by people like herself. Um, on the other hand, as we've become acutely aware of this week, um, there is always going to be pushback from the other side. Uh, our elites, our media, and even academia to an extent, or individual academics rather, are vulnerable to influence, vulnerable to disinformation narratives, and as we've seen with a scandal of the German um, journalist, extremely vulnerable to financial incentives provided by Russia to subvert our systems. So in your view, do we have to tackle that as much as we try to uh, work towards um, changing minds in Russia? I think these are separate things, the misinformation, disinformation war that Russia has waged against the West, the use of, for want of a better phrase, to use the KGB's own uh, playbook, use for idiots, um, the support for political opposition, political parties in, in Europe, as we've seen with Putin and also the KGB before that. These are separate things. And of course, we need to also engage with what Russia is going to do and will continue to do as long as Putin is in power. And that is supporting political parties from the left, far right to the far left, using hacking, bots, trolls, disinformation, propaganda, you name it. We all know the playbook that Putin has been using pretty much since he became president in 2000. And that will continue as long as he remains in power in Russia. But this report doesn't so much talk about that because it isn't necessarily what the West needs to do for itself. It is what the West needs to do to help build this future Russia. And it's also a fascinating question, isn't it? Because again, since our last conversation, we've become uh, more aware of uh, Russia's activities globally, not just locally and regionally, um, with disorder in the Middle East. Uh, you've got ongoing 
uh, Russian uh, collaboration in Syria uh, to commit appalling crimes. But it's also emerged that there's this kind of axis of autocracy or intolerance or terror, whatever label you want to put on it. And it's a kind of alternative to the world order. It's a world disorder as promoted by dictators. If we're to follow uh, many of the ideas in your report, one of the challenges is going to be to break that alliance amongst this so-called uh, axis of uh, intolerance. Well, yes, and I like the phrase, the axis of intolerance. Uh, Alexander Cooley, an American academic, has called it the authoritarian League of Gentlemen, which also sounds kind of spy and kind of cool. Um, but anyway, um, it, it certainly this needs to, there is a growing authoritarian international axis of evil, whatever you want to call them, um, but is a band of autocrats who are trying to dis dissociate established western norms to create their own values internationally and to try to destabilize the west but also the i would say the global order so that is certainly the case that the west needs to find a way to try and engage with these or countering i should say engaging with countering these people what we are fortunate about is that authoritarian regimes and this goes back to my my book on the authoritarian international they are constantly adapting and so because they constantly fear the loss of power no one wants to end up like Muammar Gaddafi in Libya dragged through the streets of Misrata they want to end up like Francisco Franco in Spain dying in their bed at the ripe old age I think of 75 I might be wrong on that but he was roughly about 75 um so you know that's where they want to end up but because autocrats have to be right every single time, whereas, for instance, processors only have to be right once, that gives a lot of pressure. So the West can, by supporting civil society, by supporting diasporas, by supporting opposition media, by supporting the opposition, they can provide pressure on these autocracies where it becomes harder and harder for these autocracies to adapt. This, of course, will take time, but it is certainly something that I think the West is slowly coming to realise that it is now a competition. Democracy is no longer the only game in town and probably hasn't been for the past decade. So it is time for democracies to come together and develop tools to try and counter, and probably successfully to do so, these autocrats. That's a fascinating point. I'll come back to that in a minute, actually, because I think this idea of sort of hybrid autocracy being uh, wealth generating in the way that uh, free societies are over terms a lot of our preconceptions but I'll, I'll come back to that one because it's i think it's important as you did in this event and in the report to make a very strong statement here which is what are the prerequisites for engagement with russia um ukrainian ones are pretty clear defeat russia starts to change accepts full culpability for its crimes offers restitution and justice so we've got what we would call the maximalist ukrainian ones what would be your definition of these prerequisites for re-engagement? Well, I think that there has to be, I mean, that certainly the West has to maintain support, not just maintain support, but give Ukraine what it needs to quickly win this war. That should have been happening from the very beginning of this war. And I would even go so far as to say that Britain and other Western countries made a mistake by removing the trainers from Ukraine just before the war because it sent a horrible signal to Putin that Ukraine was not going to be supported. So that certainly was a problem. I think in terms of the sanctions that we need to start talking about, you know, the sanctions being increased. And we're fortunate in many ways that the 2024 presidential elections are coming in Russia. And perhaps there is the point that we need to start having this discussion about seeing whether Putin can be, whether the West can classify Putin as illegitimate because these elections will be fraudulent. And this will hopefully galvanise the West and also allow them to begin dialogue with other states as to what to do with Russia. Now, in terms of the other part of the other part of your question, as abhorrent as it is, I think that there does need to be discussion with Russian elites. And this comes again from my own work on autocracies, that generally autocracies, they are all, they consist of hardliners and softliners. And this is how autocracies do change, that they democratise because softliners are given a way out, as it were. If Putin, if Russia is defeated in this war, it will force the elites to rethink where they want to be. If we start supporting the opposition, as detailed in this book, 
with a plan. Most of these elites around Putin consider themselves to be patriotic. Whether they are or not is another matter, but they consider themselves to be patriotic. If they're told, if they're given a plan that sees Russia in a better position than it is today, there is every possible there is a possibility that they will decide that Putin is no longer worth backing. Now, I'm not saying that this means that the elites will stay in power. Of, of course, that shouldn't happen at all. But it is a way to at least start to remove Putin and to start changing the regime. And the West can always support those people it wants to see having a part in future Russia, whatever that may be. It is an abhorrent thing to have to argue. But unfortunately, this is how autocracies work. Unless we are prepared to say, go, go along, go full on, and say we are not going to talk to the to Russia until the regime is fully removed. It's going to take a very long time to do that because autocracies do can survive for a very long time, just reliant on repression. If we don't, if we try to split the elites, it may speed up this process. And certainly, as we know, Putin's inner circle is getting smaller and smaller. He's increasingly, I think, paranoid about what um, you know trust levels. If he knows that people in the elites are talking to personnel in the West, or not just personnel in the West, maybe the West could use Turkey or Brazil as conduits or other countries that the elite trusts, then this could actually spark changes within the regime. And because Putin will mistrust those who may be talking to the West, it will also lead to further repression against elite personnel, which again will ratchet up the competition in terms of saying, well, we can remove Putin and all of this goes away. This, I admit, is very much pie-in-the-sky thinking, but it's certainly, in my, under in my understanding of the, auto the autocracy, how it works. It's tricky, isn't it? Because this is very much contingent, and the kind of discussions that happen are very much contingent on what the end game is. Yeah. Uh, if this is a humiliating, clear, and unambiguous defeat for Russia, then, of course... In, it goes into these negotiations having to find fresh faces who are able to make difficult compromises and, you know, deliver to the Russian people a certain element of truth. We we have to do these things because we were defeated, it was catastrophic, etc. They would need that mandate, which could, perhaps could only come from a proper, clear defeat. If Russia and Russians do not have a sense of being defeated... And in this scenario, a frozen conflict could easily be spun by the propagandists as a victory. That makes, does it not make this process infinitely more difficult and complex? Well, absolutely. And I, I, I said in the report, if uh, we, you know, saying that Russia should not, uh, sorry, it, I've, I've lost what I was going to say, but saying that uh, if Russia is, uh, Russia, you know, um, Russia will spin this as a victory. We're already seeing in terms of the propaganda that Russia isn't fighting Ukraine. Russia is fighting NATO. And it's fought, And if it's a frozen conflict, it's fought NATO to a standstill. This is the world of the Kremlin. So it certainly can spin it as a victory. And then we can expect in 10 years' time to be back here again, because Russia will say, well, we beat NATO the first time. In the same way in 2008, it wasn't the Georgians they beat. They beat NATO because the Georgian army had started to be uh, given NATO standard weaponry. And you could see the state propaganda in, in Russia driving down, you know, the roads of Georgia, looking at all the new tanks from America and France and Germany and where have you, and therefore they've beat, they beaten NATO. So it certainly is going to be the case that Russia will claim victory, regardless of what happens, uh, unless we are prepared to support Ukraine for to win this war quickly because this would lead as i argue in the report this will be a change in russia's perception because it isn't that russia has been defeated russia has been catastrophically defeated and i think still a majority of russian people believe that ukrainians are little brothers and so this would lead to a change in the thinking imperial imperial thinking but also in cultural thinking as well that the little we've just lost badly to the little brother who has pushed us back out to its borders in 1991 we've lost potentially 300,000 of our boys probably even more not to mention the wounded missing and various others so it would be a catastrophic 
change in terms of the society. And I think we've really start to lead to changes in perceptions about the empire and imperial thinking, and also about autocracy, especially if the, if the West does support Ukraine and it joins NATO, it joins the EU and becomes richer. Because Putin has always said, Slavs can't do democracy. I mean, I'm slightly exaggerating what he said, but it's pretty much those, that, along those lines. So if Ukraine can be seen to be rich and democratic, that points out to the Russians, well, why can't we have this? So it becomes even, even harder for uh, Putin. So what needs to happen ultimately to begin with is Russia has to lose this war quickly and Ukraine has to be given everything it needs not just to win militarily, but humanitarian aid, financial aid. It has to be able to join NATO and it has to be able to join the EU, preferably within the next few years. And another tricky bit, of course, associated with that, and not just for the negotiations themselves, but actually for running the Russian media machine, is that it would be very problematic to have war crimes deniers uh, and, dare I say, some of the leading propagandist figures um, still in post, still spewing genocidal hatred, bile, resentment, whatever it happens to be. Is it not also a prerequisite that these people are not involved in any future negotiation? I think certainly. I mean, this is the this is way that way. Let's be honest. This is long term that we're discussing here today, sadly, um, unless America and the West and Western states change their tune and say, yes, we are going to give Ukraine what it needs to win this war. This is a long term scenario. So, you know, yes, ideally, the propagandists, people like Sergei Markov, Vladimir Solovyov, they should be removed in the future. They should. It, and certainly they should not have any part to say in this in the negotiations that will come with this war. But and there will should be, as the report says, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or at least Russians should see justice being done at The Hague in terms of their elites being sent to the International Criminal Court. But again, this is far down the line. What needs to happen is that the Western states need to support Russian media in exile. And I know that TV dodged and T um, Medusa have said some interesting things, let's say, about Russian imperial thinking in the past. But they are, for the most part, liberal. Uh, they are believe in democracy, at least in the so, certain values of the West, and should be supported because they can get, they have a viewership in Russia. And it will increase that. It could potentially increase the viewership if supported financially. And this comes back to the idea of the whitelist concept of Google for uh, Google using YouTube has blacklisted all Russian media on YouTube, understandably so, because it's hard for someone in, in Google to see whether one, someone is pro-regime or anti-regime. But by having a whitelist, it would actually allow anti-regime bloggers, anti-regime video takers to promote, to raise revenue through adverts and therefore have a much smoother media aspect into Russia. Of course, Russia will probably block YouTube, but it's at least a start. So you have an audience there that can be used. And this is a way to start talking about the situation in terms of what Russia has done, trying to say, you know, enga engagement with the Russian public and also Western politicians should engage with these organizations as well and have you know, interviews with them saying this isn't attacking Russians, this is attacking the regime. And whilst we can both probably almost certainly agree that Russians are to blame for this war they do bear some responsibility for this war if we are to truly see that this situation is going to change and that russia can be put on a different path then we need to differentiate between the russian people and the russian regime um and as we've seen i i'm sure you saw it recently the russian field survey that came out i think it was yesterday where for the first time a majority of russians want to have negotiations about the war. And I think that this is certainly a change within that perception. That's a very small change, but this is something that I think can be the beginning. Mm. And of course, views uh, regarding Crimea mm. tend to be slightly more problematic uh, in those kind of surveys, but uh, it, it, it's certainly moving in the direction of, uh, um, dare I say, it, war fatigue, which is 
uh, lazy shorthand used in the Western media for Ukraine, but actually I suspect that war fatigue in Russia is is accelerating at a, at a faster pace, which actually, as you say, is an interesting process. Now, you mentioned media and having a far more nuanced approach to media uh, as a way of encourage encouraging alternative news sources. How does that translate then into individuals? Because there's been a furious debate over the last year and a half about whether Russians should be allowed to come to Europe, tourist visas, and so on. Um, mm. If we are to promote values and change based on certain values in Russia, shouldn't visas themselves uh, be tied to a clear political stance, which is anti-war, anti-imperial, um, and, and encourage those individuals to come here who are embracing change rather than just for pure uh, economic reasons, for instance? I think certainly that that can be tied to, um, you know, bringing Russians over, that they have to, they, they, the visas can be given to those who don't, who don't support the Putin regime, who don't believe that uh, the Russian empire, it should come back, that sort of thing. This is of course difficult because how are you going to actually do that? I think in in Britain, from what I from what I've been told by my Russian friends, they're asked questions in the British Embassy. Um, so there's going to be someone in the British Embassy saying, "Do you believe in the in the recreation of the Russian Empire?" No. Okay. Congratulations. Here's your visa. Um, so it it is a difficult situation, but I do believe that certainly the number of visas should be increased. I think that this is potential, at least in Britain and probably in the, in the West as well. I'm sure they have, well, other Western states have similar things of the high potential individual visa. This is a way to bring Russians into the West. Um, it is a way to allow them to create a safe haven, to build their own businesses, to get accommodation, to um, settle down. And this is also useful in terms of the fact that they can then when they contact their family, their friends, they can actually say, guys, it's easy to open a bank account. It's easy to come and settle in the West. This plays into the, this goes against the rhetoric of the regime, the Russophobia, the West is out to get us, it's out to destroy us, it hates Russians. We've, we've seen the propaganda, Russia is the, Russians are the new Jews and all this rubbish that they keep on spouting, but that's the way it is. This is one way to undermine that. And I think that this is also, on a purely selfish basis, it's a way to bring in the very best talent in Russia. And let's be honest, the education system in the, in Russia, in terms of IT, has been very good over the years. And this is something that would benefit the West. Now, I appreciate that's also very selfish, but it is also effective in terms of being a brain drain on Russia. So... Those diaspora, those Russians who have fled to places like Armenia, Kazakhstan, Georgia, where have you, they should also be given support in terms of getting visas into the West. Because again, it precipitates the difficulty for the regime in terms of its propaganda and also in terms of its economy. I again appreciate this probably isn't very popular uh, in, term, in terms of all of this, but I think that the number of visas for Russians should be increased. I think the same is also true for student visas. I think for student funding as well. And as I mentioned in the report, the creation of a Russian language university to support and build the next generation of Russians in terms of finance, economics, politics, judiciary, possibly even law enforcement if we get to that stage as well. But this is all very important in terms of building for the future, in terms of the generations that are to come. And it's an interesting point, isn't it? Um, and there's a couple of points come out of there. I mean, one is, of course, the type of courses we allow people to come and do. And many, many people I've spoken to but, uh, from Ukraine who were active in Maidan, yeah. not only have they come over and... Uh, you know, learnt economic skills, many, many of them have come over and done uh, topics like governance, politics, and, you know, worked with organisations that are specifically uh, associated with building out civil and uh, political society and reforming the judiciary. So should we have, uh, so let's divide this into a couple of questions. The first, should we give a preference to um those courses and those students who want to actually go on on uh, you know learn subjects that are around sort of state and society building as opposed to just sort of pure economic skills 
the economy is important because what is it now that 75 percent of the russian economy is state controlled um you know it's not official of course but lots of these private businesses are actually if you look down through all the different uh, companies that exist they're actually controlled by people in the state so economics is important but certainly state building i think for the future is going to be very important in terms of working out what will actually work in russia and this again requires that russians don't just copy the institutions that exist in the west of course they should see parliaments and you know other organizations in the west but they need to know that what is organic in russia can be built in russia and should be built in russia but to give them the skills and the training for this and i think that this is very important in terms of the politics in terms of the judiciary because again the judiciary really remains along with the security services, the repressive part of the regime in terms of we've seen the Sasha Skolnichenko today getting seven years for anti-war price tax and various other people as well. So it's certain the judiciary is a strong arm of the regime. If we can create a judiciary, ju lawyers, uh, judges who have a, who, are, who have been trained in democratic thinking for want of a better phrase then it certainly is going to help for the future the difficulty is obviously getting these people back into russia that 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 remains something that i think we have to address for the future because there is no way until the putin regime collapses that these people will get back in and of course they will be perceived probably by a lot of russians as western stooges but this is unfortunately the dif very difficult situation that we find ourselves in and i don't think there is a clear answer in regards to that uh, very similar in fact to uh, you know a dissident perhaps returning during the soviet period again uh, would would perhaps that have that extreme distance and mm. distrust um possibly uh, it, it, it's worse now because it's it's nationalism as opposed to a uh, a political ideology which is uh, which is being imposed um this idea of brain drain, I think, is absolutely fascinating because um, Karachovsky mentioned it uh, during the event. And I've heard a, a fascinating video by Vladimir Milov uh, talking to Michael Naki. And they're pointing out that sanctions are only partially working and only partially enforced, not fully enforced um, by Western governments. It's, it's like a bit of a leaking sieve. And mm. actually... When you look at central bank activities by so-called liberal bankers like Nabulina, uh, they've created an extraordinarily resilient economy despite the greatest sanctions in history and are actually doing far better than anyone expected. Um, so the argument made by Khodorkovsky and Milov is that actually the brain drain is a far, far more effective way to degrade Russia's military industries um, than sanctions. If you suck out all the engineers and scientists, um, then then simply they will have a, a, a really quite serious problem. Well, I think certainly that's the case. Sanctions have always been a blunt tool and will remain a blunt tool. And there's a way, always way around sanctions. And the Russian government has experience since 2014 of evading sanctions and has plenty of allies like Belarus and Iran who have even better experience of evading sanctions and know how to get around these sort of things. So sanctions will always be a blunt tool. And you know, as we saw with 127 British companies that the Financial Times reported about still trading technology with Russia, companies will try and evade them as well. So it's very much a two horse race in regards to that. So, um, you know, I think the brain drain is a far more effective situation. The fact that, again, the Russian state keeps on talking about wanting IT specialists to come back to Russia. I think Dmitry Peskov last week talked about mathematicians and the number of mathematicians who have disappeared from Russian institutions, which tends to affect science and various other aspects of their uh, technology sector. The, these are these are major problems. So I think the brain drain can be an effective way to degrade the Russian war machine. We had some 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 curious questions during the event. The one that I asked Korachovsky and then and then uh, got the chance yes. to discuss afterwards was, "What do you do about the current funding model uh, in Russia, which is essentially to use the wealth from extraction industries, uh, oil, uh, gas, coal, aluminium, etc., and then you essentially create a parasitic class in Moscow of Silvia Key, uh, apparatchiks, oligarchs." Um, 
and of course uh you know the sort of uh the fsb uh, mm. type structure in a way if you're going to get a flowering of democracy or allow uh, ground up grassroots democracy to start to develop you have to kind of dismantle the entire economic model that feeds the autocracy or tyranny that currently exists otherwise it simply morphs or puts a bit of a you know a veneer over the top and pretends it's liberal but everything remains largely the same and we've seen that happen actually throughout uh russian history that perhaps is the continuity between the soviet union and uh and, and now which is a, a century centrally planned parasitic um elite centered on moscow and Khorovsky kind of agreed with that, and, and and it came up with a rather interesting suggestion that you, know, you can't abolish these industries, but what you can do is redistribute the wealth from them equitably, yeah. and not have whatever ninety five percent of them end up in Moscow. Um, what does your report think of of the, the the whole vertical system, and what would need to be done with that? Well, I mean, in some in terms of the vertical that exists in Russia, there needs to be a way to try and weaken it. And I think that this again comes back in terms of providing, you know, with the future future generations going back to Russia in terms of having been trained uh, with the development of institutions and certain things, because they exist, the institutions exist, parliament exists in Russia, political parties exist in Russia. You've got various Dumas in other ci in cities across Russia that exist. But what they've been hollowed out to, to such an extent, that has to be able to change. That has to change in terms of what will happen with the vertical. And that will also lead to a change in terms of the Russian Federation actually being a federation on anything more than just paper. So this, again, would lead to more voices. I think, you know, there is something that the, the 1990s failed to do, and that is lustration. Now, where we go with frustration, that remains to be seen. And that certainly is going to be in the future, because this is going to be something the regime is likely to go, is obviously going to bite tooth and nail over. Um, the I've seen some reports that the idea is to frustrate judges, and therefore you would undermine the, one of the repressive capacities of the regime, and therefore you would have anti-regime judges that would then then um, you know come to take bring the elite to trial and therefore they would be moved that way. The problem is that you would also have to make very sure that those judges are no longer beholden to the president and the Supreme Court and various other aspects as well. So that could be one way, or you go for the entire. Or you, I, I think, frustration because the regime is going to fight tooth and nail remains overly difficult. This could lead to Putin and a few others going to the ICC in The Hague, and at least justice being seen to be done for some of them. It could also lead to a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as in South Africa. And I think that may be the most appropriate model, at least in the current time. Of course, I would love to see a lustration system that wipes out the security services, that takes out the presidential administration, the Security Council, basically every ministry that exists in Russia. Um, but whether you that, that would take a significant effort and financial reserves by the West to be able to train all the people that would need to be, need to fill those positions. I don't know if that will happen. And I think that this is going to have to be a very slow process. But again, I think the West can also provide this by saying that sanctions, this is what it would take to lift some sanctions or to at least ease those sanctions, but they're going to snap back. And again, by increasing the sanctions, actually talking to different ministries, different governments, having you know dialogue with each other, also talking to the Russian opposition who are on the ground and know who to sanction, sanctioning not just the elites, but their families is, is, is I think, absolutely necessary. So it is a neat, whilst I've said that sanctions are a blunt tool, if they it can be done, they, they can be used effectively. It's now up to the West to actually do that. And this can be a way to bring the Russian elite, probably kicking and screaming, uh, into accepting that they are might have to pay reparations, well, not might, will have to pay reparations, I should say, to Ukraine, that there is going to be some form of lustration, preferably across the board, but at least in the judiciary, at least the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, at least bringing Putin and hopefully people like Nikolai Petrushev to justice in The Hague. That 
would be, I think, how it would happen. But again, this is all a matter of saying we need to start talking about this because we need to start planning for this. Because when, if and when the regime collapses, it's going to be very quick. And the West and the Russian opposition need to be ready for that day. Because if they don't, then we're going to have a Putin 2.0 or possibly someone worse, a Nikolai Petrushev 2.0 possibly. Um, so who knows where, where this is going. But as, a, as the report says, we need to start having this debate. Another area, of course, is church and state divisions. Yes. So without necessarily entirely copying Western models, um, do you think it's also important to have a division of powers um, along similar Western lines with executive judiciary and a split with church and state? Because, well, actually throughout Russian history, the church has been an instrument of uh, the elite, uh, of, of the uh, power structures. And of course, under the KGB slash FSB, it has become even more than that. Um, not so much a, a spiritual organization, but an organization of, I would say, malign superstition. Uh, and it's essentially a wing of of the secret police. Um, mm -hmm. How do you go about doing that? And could the church actually become a significant source of independence and opposition to future autocracy? I mean, I agree that the Russian Orthodox Church has had a long history of being part of the state or being close to the government. And this has always been Rus Orthodox thinking, at least in Russia, that it is just a part of another arm of the state. So certainly this is going to take, it's, it's an institutional change. And again, perception change in terms of society as to what role the Orthodox Church is going to have to, going to, going to have. To a great extent, it is the FSB with crosses. So it would also need possibly to face some sort of illustration. I think the Orthodox Church, at least under Patriarch Kirill, has done a very fine job of hopefully beginning its own death sentence in terms of supporting the war, in terms of, I mean, what kind of church can say, yes, it's okay to kill people? Um, I know the Church of England has probably had some very... Uh, imperial views in the past that's indeed true but i'd like to think that today the well who knows but the archbishop of canterbury wouldn't say it's okay to go out and kill your the people in france because you know during a war this sort of thing so i think that the russian orthodox church has started its own demise in terms of where it is today it would need a significant change in terms of institutions but we have seen some deacons in the church being excommunicated i'm not sure if that's the right term but they've been thrown out of the orthodox church because they said this is this is wrong how can you call yourself christians and advocate for a genocidal war we should be as christians we believe in peace and bringing people together so they can be used they can be tr you know brought to to the west or supported by the west to create maybe a church in exile for now so we're back to the church in exile after the, after the collapse of the Russian Empire. But this can also rebuild in terms of trying to split the church from the state, trying to actually say this is Christianity, this is the church in terms of believing in peace and also a voice in the darkness for the Russian people. And it would be countering the state. So that would also start to attack the autocracy that has beset Russia for millennia in terms of the role that the church could have in the future. And I'm not a, I'm not a huge expert on it. I, I have friends who, who know an awful lot more about it, and they'll probably be shaking their heads at this question uh, as it will display my ignorance. But I, I found it fascinating uh, when I was in a town called Kaluga hmm. uh, many years ago. Uh, and someone was describing to me the differences between the uh, old believers and the uh you know uh, peter the first reformed mm -hmm. church and for a period of time they seem to exist uh in a level of competition you'd have uh you know two two sort of dominations of orthodoxy one really you know not official and not 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 that well approved 
but nonetheless they had uh, uh, you know churches in different towns run by these different denominations you had an element of competition and what seemed to be fascinating is that in this particular town it was the merchants the traders the liberals free thinkers who were more drawn to the old believer church it was had this little bit more dynamism um and uh, less association with the state and i found that idea of of introducing competition into not just the church but every level of russian society perhaps as a a mechanism for driving change well i think certainly competition is all is always good because it would force the church in the, in this case to actually listen to society at the moment it is very much a closed shop as it were, there is no or very limited alternatives. Yes, of course, Russia, the Russian Federation does have Muslim populations. It does have Jewish populations. Some churches, some Christian churches do still exist, although they are increasingly persecuted, I would say. But certainly there hasn't been a lot of competition for the Orthodox Church. And I think that this would certainly be highly beneficial. I think that competition in terms of society at all levels of society is going to be again a, a long-term scenario we as, as, as they keep on repeating this is a long-term scenario in terms of this of course i can't would love to say this will happen tomorrow it won't but you know there certainly is this need for competition at, in across society because i think it builds up thinking in terms of it's okay for competition to happen it isn't about it wouldn't lead to the breakup of the state it's okay for other people to have opposing views because you can hear those views and you can try and accommodate them this is okay this is perfectly okay it's not anarchy and i think that that perhaps could be something again going back to the media that you could have alternative views so you know do it, it needs to be worked out certainly but you unlike the bbc you could unlike the bbc you where you have to have both sides of the argument you could have almost like lbc let's say one person who is a socialist and then in the next hour you have someone maybe not on the far right in russia because that's obviously appalling but uh someone center right let's say um because at least it allows different views to be heard and again, this is all part of the discussion in terms of not just building for the opposition, the plan for Russia, but also engaging Russian society and trying to bring Russians into supporting this potential future. Because as we both know, when Russians talk about their ident they are identity, they always talk about being patriotic. They always talk about being orthodox and proud of Russia. And to an extent, I, you know, the pride of Russia, I understand. Um, the Russia is a, is a, is a good, is a beautiful country, um, but with many, many problems, but it is a beautiful country. Um, and so that there needs to be a way to engage that society and bring them in over time, because this is about, this is, this is going to, it's time. It needs mm. to, you need, can't change people's opinions immediately. And I think this is also a problem of the Russian state historically that one regime has collapsed and they've moved to the exact opposite and then that regime collapses and they go the other way and it's all it's, it's a pendulum and the pendulum keeps on swinging from one side and it leads to huge polarization and i think that there needs to be a way to bring society into the middle in order to try and say well this is where we are trying to get to because again it comes with if you can get the majority in, then you have acceptance in society that we are trying to get to this position. Again, this could be wishful thinking on my part, but yeah. And the last area, and because uh, I always try to to relate these back and, and mention Ukraine, uh, which I think is an incredibly important element in all of this, Um if Ukraine hadn't been undergoing extraordinary internal transformation, if it hadn't been for Maidan uh, and for expelling the Russian-sponsored regime um, that was trying to take it to a sort of Belarus scenario, that's my belief at least from, from the various conversations I've had, um, none of this would be happening. And uh, Ukraine would be a Russian vassal state uh, and, and it wouldn't be pushing against these boundaries of, of autocracy, which, uh, mm -hmm. which Russia clearly doesn't like. Taking that as an example, though, it took 30 years and multiple revolutions um, to 
uh, you know, embark on this democratic transition in Ukraine. It's a process that isn't even finished yet. We can't discount that there won't be other, uh, you know, lurches uh, and, uh, and and popular um, protests and so on in future uh, to con- continue to drive that. Russians and, of course, Russian propaganda leverages this very effectively, has a complete aversion for the idea of revolution. Um, and, and and therefore, they're able to dismiss uh, actually what's gone on in Ukraine, because underneath it, there's some extraordinarily powerful processes uh, based on emergence of communities, techniques, mm. uh, ideas, which actually Russia could benefit from. So whereas I don't wish... A, a large revolution uh, on on Russia it could be counterproductive. Perhaps a series of small localized uh, revolutions might be beneficial if they're based on certain values and on you know organization from the ground up and a, dare I say a certain level of uh, social cohesion amongst the opposition. What's your view on order versus disorder and Russia actually learning uh, and embracing? some of those uh, sort of techniques uh, that uh, that have been unfolding in Ukraine? Well, uh, you, I think that Ukra- Ukraine is a very different, is a different country to Russia in many respects and has always had, as Luke and Ways talks about pluralism by default. It's all, civil, civil society is always, exi- has, has been strong because the state has been so weak. It has had period. It has had revolutions. The revolution on granite in 1990, the Orange Revolution 2004, the Revolution Dignity 2014 to 2015, probably still ongoing. Um, but it's so it's a very different thing, state to Russia. Having said that, Russia has had revolutions in the past. They've tended to be violent. Um, I would say that there has been civil society was growing. I would say until around about 2018, possibly 20, as late as 2020. In terms of, you saw environmental protests in Voronezh, you saw them in Kimki, you had Shias as well, you had protests throughout 2017 and 2018 against corruption and various other things. So Russians do protest. It, it hasn't been very clear over the past uh, year and a half sadly but they have protested and i think that plays into what mark galliotti said on your channel as well that you know most people aren't brave they're not going to go out and having seen what the russian government has done to people in uh you know butcher why would you go out and face that situation so you know that's by the by but whether that's moral or not is, is another whole discussion so i think that in in putin's russia the idea it's going to take a significant change of thinking to allow to even allow let's say rostov or um ulyanovsk or kazan to go their own way in terms of developing um developing anti-corruption initiatives like prozoro developing various other civil society initiatives because this would be catastrophic for the putin regime because if they were seen to be effective then People in Bashkortostan and Ufa might go, well, the people of Tatarstan are, are you know, dealing with this corruption. Their civil society is flourishing there and the state is shown to be weak. We can do this as well. And that spirals. So I, I think that it would take a very different regime, similar to what happens in China, where the regime is willing, up to a point, of course, to allow different regions to develop policies based on... Uh, what's his name um stephen heilman i think at trier university i think it's high i think it's stephen Heilman. anyway um he's talked about regions in china where they will go and take an education policy let's say from sweden the netherlands denmark finland britain implement them in five different regions and see which one works and then they will decide to send it across the country i can't imagine putin would ever allow that to happen and the kremlin in its current form in terms of the personnel then they don't think like that so as much as i would love to see the idea and as much as i do believe that civil society still operates in russia i think that we are at the moment in a in a police state within within that, russia that's that's an interesting place to end and this is the the, the sort of last uh type question really and we're back to where we started which is that Ukrainian civil society uh, 
very much was a combination of history, culture, etc. But also, it was allowed to develop in the absence of a, in the absence of a strong state, um, a dysfunctional state, certainly, but but a weak state nonetheless. Um, and where there wasn't these huge revenues from extraction resources to fund a silly key to repress them, we come back to the idea that it is so critical for Russia to experience an unambiguous defeat. Mm because that would lead to a weak state as opposed to a weakened state. And actually a weakened state is maybe the worst possible uh, scenario. You know, we had the, the strong state up until about 2012, able, confident enough to operate a hybrid information, hybrid autocracy with, with a high degree of, of, of freedom, as long as you, you know, didn't participate too much in politics. Then we've got the period of the of the weakened state lashing out, being extraordinarily aggressive. Um, so do you think that a weak central Russian state, a little bit like the weakness we saw in the 90s, is the prerequisite for a lot of this uh, let's say, evolution of democratic process? Uh, at, at the moment, I would say, you know, cop taking uh, Daniel Treisman and Sergei Guriev's uh, book, Spin Dictators, we're in a fear dictatorship in, in Russia at the moment. Timothy Fry has talked about the weak strongman, and to an extent that's true, and I think that is actually increasingly the case because Putin is isolated, his inner circle is small. I think the Siloviki, the different factions of the Siloviki, again, when we talk about the collective West, we talk about the Siloviki as this one homogenous group. They're not. Um, they are different, different, lots of different groups doing their own thing. And I think that's certainly the case now. Um, so, you know, Russia is both strong and weak at the same time. It's a very interesting hybrid in terms of that. Now, in terms of whether I, I think that, yes, of course, that... A 90, maybe not the 1990s because Yeltsin was an autocrat, in my opinion. Um, he, if he, if he'd been, if he'd had better cards, we'd be talking about well, maybe not Yeltsin because he probably would have drunk himself to death. But someone else uh, like Putin, it would be the same situation, and that's where it happened. Um, so, I think that there is certainly a need to for a weak state to emerge in Russia, a central state that doesn't. I'm not talking about the breakup of the Russian Federation. I don't think that will happen. And if it does, the West needs to intervene immediately because it needs to get control of the nuclear weapons. But we can, you know, if that happens, we can have a whole new discussion on that. Um, so I think that certainly a weak state with a greater role for the federate, federal subjects would certainly be important, is certainly important for Russia. And the way to do this is a complete defeat in Ukraine. And it still amazes me that you and I and many other people have been shouting about this for a year and a half and we're still having to shout about it. That the only way to the only way to solve this crisis, to support to give Ukraine what it needs, to change the regime in Russia. We haven't even begun to talk about the change in Belarus, which would come as well. Possibly also weakening autocrats in China, Iran, Saudi, well, maybe not Saudi Arabia, but other places. The post-Soviet space giving hope to other people in, you know, Georgia, in Moldova, because you will undermine Russia's support for Abkhazia, Transnistria. You would also help Democrats in Kazakhstan and Central Asia. The, it, it, it makes me very angry having to keep on saying Ukraine must win this war and must be given all it needs to do it quickly. And I still find it amazing that I, we're having to shout this out over a year and a half into this horrible, horrible war that has been brought on by the Russian people and by Putin especially. And what they are doing has been absolutely abhorrent. And if the West truly believes its values and democracy and the human rights, then even if Ukraine was a fascist state, which, you know, as Russian propaganda paints it, it doesn't matter. It's been attacked and therefore you support it. But Ukraine is not a fascist state. Ukraine is a democracy, weak, anarchic as it may be, but beautiful. And the West should stand by its values. And yes, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm now quite angry. Uh, That's that... <laughs> That's probably a good place to end. Yeah. Uh, it's a very clear statement of intent there, but it's also a strategic one because everything we discussed, any future changes, evolution for the better in Russian politics and society is contingent on them 
knowing they were defeated and being defeated and that kind of uh, evil that's unfolded um, has some form of of justice. Uh, Stephen, it's been an absolute thrill speaking to you. Uh, I will put links to the report, which I assume can be downloaded as a PDF into the uh, description of the video, as well as links to various things you're associated with. Uh, I do encourage people to follow up on that. Thank you so much for shouting into the void. I hope someone listens to you and uh, and your colleagues soon. Thank you very much, Jonathan.